we are going to continue with Virgil's Aeneid. So when we last left off last week, we are in book two. And Aeneas is... So in book one, Aeneas gets to Carthage, right? And he's telling Queen Dido, who was already open to Aeneas arriving and knew about the Trojans. Um, but also, Venus did some magic through her son and made her especially receptive and open and uh, admiring of Aeneas and his words. Yeah, I don't I don't want to be anywhere near a tornado. Those those do not look those don't look cool. So Aeneas has gone back and he's telling <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> there are strange things going on in that room over there. I can't even explain it. Yes, uh, Dido certainly is. We'll, and, and we'll get back to Dido. We have this interruption where Aeneas is telling the story, but we'll get back to what she's up to. Uh, so again, we're hearing about now the end of the Trojan War and the Trojan Horse. And we had La Laocoon who was warning them, don't bring that thing in here. And then serpents came and ate him and his kids. And the last thing we ended up with, Cassandra saying, also don't do it, but nobody listens to Cassandra. So, night falls. The fleet comes back in, right? They've been hiding just offshore. And, let's see. And then Sinon, who was that one Greek who was left to tell the lies, he comes in and he opens up the belly of the horse. Opened wide, the horse emitted men. Gladly they dropped out of the cavern. Captains first, Thysandrus, Sthenelus, and the man of iron, Ulysses. Hand over hand upon the rope, Achamus, Thoas, Neoptolemus, and Prince Machaon, Menelaus, and then the master builder, Epios, who designed the horse decoy. Into the darkened city, buried deep in sleep and wine, they made their way cut the few sentries down, let in their fellow soldiers at the gate, and joined their combat companies as planned. Dun, dun, dun. That night, or that time of night it was when the first sleep, gift of the gods, begins for ill mankind, arriving gradually, delicious rest. In sleep, in dream, Hector appeared to me, gaunt with sorrow, streaming tears, all torn, as by the violent car on his death day, and black with bloody dust, his puffed-out feet cut by the rawhide thongs. Ah, God, the look of him! How changed from that proud Hector who returned to Troy wearing Achilles' armor, or that one who pitched the torches on Danaan ships, his beard all filth, his hair matted with blood, showing the wounds, the many wounds, received outside his father's city walls. I seemed myself to weep and call upon the man in grieving speech brought from the depth of me. So Aeneas is saying that in that fateful night when the Greeks are, are attacking from, from the horse, letting the other ones in, that Hector, who, remember, had already died previously, that Hector appeared to Aeneas in a dream. And Aeneas says, oh my god, what, what's, what's going on? He wasted no reply on my poor questions, but heaved a great sigh from his chest and said, I give up and go, child of the goddess. Save yourself out of these flames. The enemy holds the city walls, and from her height, Troy falls in ruin. Fatherland and Priam have their due. If by one hand our towers could be defended, by this hand my own, they would have been. Her holy things, her gods of hearth and household, Troy commends to you. Accept them as companions of your days. Go find for them the great walls that one day you'll dedicate when you have roamed the sea. As he said this, he brought out from the sanctuary chaplets and Vesta, lady of the hearth, with her eternal fire. Welcome, Erdinsk. I know, look, it's... I'm shorn. So Aeneas basically says, uh, Troy is screwed. It's over. If it could have been defended, I, I would have done it. It's over now. Get out while you can. Take our gods with you. 
and you'll take them to a new great walled city, what will eventually be a walled city. While I dreamed, the turmoil rose with anguish in the city. More and more, although Anchises' house lay in seclusion, muffled among trees, the din at the grim onset grew, and now I shook off sleep. I climbed to the rooftop to cup my ears and listen, and the sound was like the sound a grass fire makes in grain, whipped by a south wind, or a torrent foaming out of a mountainside to strew in ruined fields, happy crops, the yield of plowing teams, or woodland borne off in the flood. In wonder, the shepherd listens on a rocky peak. I knew then what our trust had won for us, knew the Danaean fraud, Dephobus' great house in flames, already caving in under the overpowering god of fire, Ucalagon's already caught nearby, the glare lighting the straits beyond Sigium, the cries of men, the wild calls of the trumpets. So you can imagine this gigantic, magnificent city at night, and slowly, slowly but surely, there's... You know, there's attacking going on, there's fires being set, there's the, the din of battle screams, and the sound is getting louder and louder and louder. To arm was my first maddened impulse, not that anyone had a fighting chance in arms. Only I burned to gather up some force for combat, and to man some high redoubt. So fury drove me, and it came to me that meeting death was beautiful in arms. Then here, eluding the Achaean spears, come Panthus, Othyrus' son, priest of Apollo, carrying holy things, our conquered gods, and pulling a small grandchild along. He ran, despairing to my doorway. Where's the crux, Panthus, I said. What strong point shall we hold? So, of course, even though, number one, Aeneas is woken up by a dream that Hector has come to him, an apparition, a dream, who knows, but Hector has said, you can't fight. The time for fighting is over. You have to get out. And then Aeneas wakes up. He looks out. He sees that this is... It's beyond desperate. It's unwinnable. But he's still... The first thing he wants to do is fight. Right? And this guy, Panthus, comes up. He says, Come on, Panthus. Where can we go fight? Before I could say more, he groaned and answered, The last day for Dardania has come. The hour not to be fought off any longer. Trojans we have been... Ilium has been, the glory, of the, two, the glory of the Teucrians is no more. Black Jupiter has passed it on to Argos. Greeks are masters in our burning city. Tall as a cliff set in the heart of town, their horse pours out armed men. The conqueror, gloating Sinon, brews new conflagrations. Troops hold the gates, as many thousand men as ever come from great Mycenae. Others block the lanes with crossed spears. Glittering in a combat line, sword blades are drawn for slaughter. Even the first guards at the gates can barely offer battle or blindly make a stand. Impelled by these words, by the powers of heaven, into the flames I go, into the fight, where harsh fury and the din and shouting skyward rise in, calls. Crossing my path in moonlight, five fell in with me, companions, Riphius, an Epitus, a great soldier, Hypanus, Dimus, cleaving to my side, with young Coroibus, Migdon's son. It happened that in those very days this man had come to Troy, aflame with passion for Cassandra, bringing to Priam and the Phrygians a son-in-law's right hand. Unlucky one, to have been deaf to what his bride foretold. Everyone's deaf to what Cassandra foretells. Now when I saw them grouped on edge for battle, I took it all in and said briefly, Soldiers, brave as you are to no end, if you crave to face the last fight with me, and no doubt of it, how matters stand for each of us, one can see. The gods by whom this kingdom stood are gone, gone from the shrines and altars. You defend a city lost in flames. Come, let us die. We'll make a rush into the thick of it. The conquered have one safety, hope for none. Hmm. The desperate odds doubled their fighting spirit. From that time on, like predatory wolves in fog and darkness, when a savage hunger drives them blindly on, and cubs in lairs lie waiting with dry, famished jaws, just so, through arrow flights and enemies we ran, toward our sure death, straight for the city's heart. 
cavernous black night over and around us. Who can describe the havoc of that night? Or tell the deaths? Or tally wounds with tears? The ancient city falls after dominion many long years. In windrows on the streets, in homes on solemn porches of the gods, dead bodies lie. And not alone the Trojans pay the price with their heart's blood. At times manhood returns to fire even the conquered, and Danaan conquerors fall. Grief everywhere, everywhere terror, and, the, and all shapes of death. Boom. Oh, yeah. Hope for none. Flee, flee. So, uh... Yeah, so again, even with the, the dire proclamations, even with even with the seeing what is to come, Aeneas is like, no, no, I have to go and fight. I have to try. And he gathers up a few a few good, loyal men, and they go skulking through the city doing what they can, which is definitely not going to be enough. Um Yeah, so they go and they kill some more people. Uh, people mistake them for Greeks and they're like, come on, and then they attack them and kill them. Alright, yeah, so they have they have some minor successes. When gods are contrary, they stand by no one. Here before us came Cassandra, Priam's virgin daughter, dragged by her long hair out of Minerva's shrine. Lifting her brilliant eyes in vain to heaven, her eyes alone as her white hands were bound. Coroibus, infuriated, could not bear it, but plunged into the midst to find his death. We all went after him, our swords at play, but here, here first, from the temple's gable's heights, from the temple gable's height, we met a hail of missiles from our friends, pitiful execution by their error who thought us Greeks from our Greek plumes and shields. They had killed Greeks and then put on their stuff to sneak through. Then, with a groan of anger, seeing the virgin wrested from them, Danaeans from all sides rallied and attacked us. Fiery Ajax, Atreus's sons, Dolopians in a mass, as when a cyclone breaks, conflicting winds will come together, west wind, south wind, east wind, riding high out of the dawnland, forests bend and roar, all raging in a spume, Nereus with his trident churns the deep. Then some, whom we had taken by surprise under cover of night throughout the city and driven off, came back again. They knew our shields and arms for liars now, our speech alien to their own. They overwhelmed us. Coroibus fell at the warrior goddess's altar, killed by Peneleus. And Riphius fell, a man uniquely just among the Trojans, the soul of equity. But the gods would have it differently. Hypanus, Dymus died, shot down by friends. Nor did your piety, Panthus nor Apollo's fillets shield you as you went down. So they're just dying left and right. Uh, ashes of Ilium, flames that consumed my people, here I swear that in your downfall I did not avoid one weapon, one exchange with the Danaeans, and if it had been fated, my own hand had earned my death. But we were torn away from that place, Iphitus and Peleus too, one slow with age, one wounded by Ulysses, called by a clamor at the hall of Priam. Truly we fought here a prodigious fight, as though there were none elsewhere, not a death in the whole city. Mars gone berserk, Danaeans in a rush to scale the roof, the gate besieged by a tortoise shell of overlapping shields. Um, now that is a anachronism, the idea of uh, and you've seen this probably in movies, possibly in video games, but um, soldiers fighting together with shields that can overlap and then they can pack together and even raise them up. So basically the front rank holds their shields straight and every rank behind holds their shields up to make what's called a, a tortoise shell. Uh, that did not exist in, <laughs> in the time of the Trojan War. That came much later, um, especially the... Other people started it, but the Romans perfected it with their with their what we would call like tower shields, and it was the it was a maneuver called the testudo, uh, the tortoise, and it was a way of protecting a group of troops from all sides, even from above, in order to get through. Uh, yeah, it's definitely the, it's interesting. The purple is is fading, and then the the other colors are chipping, but I 
I don't I don't do a lot of manual labor. <laughs> so <laughs> I have some a, a built in built in help for stuff like that. So like I said, a bit of a of an anachronism, but you know, it gives it definitely gave Romans a sense of, of what was happening. Uh, let's see, fighting, fighting, fighting. Now we plucked up heart to help the royal house, to give our men a respite, and to add our strength to theirs, though all were beaten. And we had for entrance a rear door, secret, giving on a passage between the palace halls. In other days, Andromache, poor lady, often used it, going alone to see her husband's parents, or taking a Styanax to his grandfather. So Andromache was the wife of Hector, and a Styanax was their son. I climbed high on the roof, <clears throat> where hopeless men were picking up and throwing futile missiles. Here was a tower like a promontory, rising toward the stars above the roof. All Troy, the Danaean ships, the Achaean camp, were visible from this. Now close behind it, with crowbars, where the flooring made loose joints, we pried it from its bed and pushed it over. Down with a rending crash and sudden ruin, wide over the Danaean lines it fell. But fresh troops moved up, and the rain of stones, with every kind of missile, never ceased. Uh, just at the outer doors of the vestibule sprang Pyrrhus, all in bronze and glittering, as a serpent hidden, swollen underground by a cold winter, writhes into the light on vile grass fed, his old skin cast away, renewed and glossy, rolling slippery coils, with lifted underbelly rearing sunward and triple tongue a flicker. Now we're talking about a famous, very strong, powerful Greek warrior. Now, what do we think... What do we think the author is trying to tell us if he's being compared to a snake slithering out of his hiding place after a cold winter. Yeah, he's, he's not, not a cool dude. Close beside him, giant Periphus and Automedon, his armor bearer, once Achilles' driver, besieged the place with all the young of Skyros, hurling their torches at the palace roof. Pyrrhus, shouldering forward with an axe, broke down the stony threshold, forced apart hinges and brazen door jams, and chopped through one panel of the door, splitting the oak to make a window, a great, great breach, kind of like uh, Johnny in the... Here's Johnny. In um, uh, Clockwork Orange. No, Clockwork The Shining. <laughs> Wrong movie. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I had Clockwork Orange on the brain because, uh, spoilers, if you watch the Space Jam 2 trailer, uh, if you were a very keen eye observer, because I didn't, I didn't catch it, but um, like I said, keen-eyed observers noticed that despite the fact that they cut Pepe Le Pew out of the movie, there are the droogs from Clockwork Orange in the trailer to Space Jam 2. An interesting choice. An interesting choice. Um, yeah, I'm not a... Yeah, uh, yes, apparently Pepe Le Pew has been excised from that movie. Apparently. I mean, who knows. Um, snakes are... Yeah, snakes are okay. I don't know. I'm not... Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of snakes. They are. We, um... Here in Southern California, we, we have rattlesnakes. So whenever you're on a hike, you definitely need to be on the lookout for uh, for those things. And I've seen them on hikes several times. I've seen come across rattlesnakes. It's that kind of thing where, like, as long as you don't disturb them, they're not likely to attack you. So if you see one, it's probably just just doing its thing and you leave it alone. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so Pyrrhus is, uh, again, one of the, at, by this point, one of the most uh, powerful of the Greek soldiers. He's just rampaging through. Let's see, let me skip ahead a little bit. And, oh, and Pyrrhus is leading a group into the royal palace, so Priam's palace. 
Uh, the Greeks broke through into the vestibule, cut down the guards, and made the wide hall seethe with men-at-arms. A tumult greater than when dikes are burst and a foaming river swirling out in a flood whelms every parapet and races on through fields and all over lowland plains, bearing off pens and cattle. Uh, and yes, it does say whelms, not overwhelms, just whelms. I myself saw Neoptolemus furious with blood in the entranceway, and saw the two Atridae, that is uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus, two descendants of Atreus. Hecuba I saw, and her hundred daughters, Priam before the altars, with his blood drenching the fires that he himself had blessed. Those fifty bridal chambers, hope of a line so flourishing, those doorways high and proud, adorned with takings of barbaric gold, were all brought low. Fire had them, or the Greeks, or both. What was the fate of Priam, you may ask? Seeing his city captive, seeing his own royal portals rent apart, his enemies in the inner rooms, the old man uselessly put on his shoulders, shaking with old age, armor, unused for years, belted a sword on, and made for the masked enemy to die. Under the open sky in a central court stood a big altar, near it a laurel tree of great age, leaning over in deep shade, embowered the penates. At this altar Hecuba and her daughters, like white doves blown down in a black storm, clung together. Enfolding holy images in their arms, now seeing Priam in a young man's gear, called out, or she called out. My poor husband, what mad thought drove you to buckle on those weapons? Where are you trying to go? The time is past for help like this, for this kind of defending. Even if my own Hector could be here, come to me now. The altar will protect us, or else you'll die with us. So in theory, in theory, if you're an ancient Greek, Trojan, any of these essentially related people, if you have an altar to the gods and you go onto that altar without weapons, uh, people are not supposed to come and kill you, is essentially the, the deal. So Priam's wife, the queen, Hecuba, she and her daughters are on this altar, and they're beseeching Priam, look, you're an old dude, put down the weapons, come over here with us, and you'll be, you'll be safe. She drew him close, heavy with years, and made a place for him to rest on the consecrated stone. Now see Polites, one of Priam's sons, escaped from Pyrrhus's butchery and on the run through enemies and spears, down colonnades, through empty courtyards, wounded. Close behind comes Pyrrhus, burning for the death stroke. Has him, catches him now, and lunges with the spear. The boy has reached his parents and before them goes down, pouring out his life with blood. Now Priam, in the very midst of death, would neither hold his peace nor spare his anger. For what you've done, for what you've dared, he said, if there is care in heaven for atrocity, may the gods render fitting thanks, reward you as you deserve. You forced me to look on at the destruction of my son, defiled a father's eyes with death. That great Achilles you claim to be the son of, and you lie was not like you to Priam, his enemy. To me, who threw himself upon his mercy, he showed compunction, gave me back for burial the bloodless corpse of Hector, and returned me to my own realm. The old man threw his spear with feeble impact, blocked by the ringing bronze. It hung there harmless from the jutting boss. Then Pyrrhus answered, You'll report the news to Pelides, my father. Don't forget my sad behavior, the degeneracy of Neoptolemus. Now die! With this, to the altar step itself, he dragged him trembling, slipping in the pooled blood of his son, and took him by the hair with his left hand. The sword flashed up in his right. Up to the hilt, he thrust it in his body. That was the end of Priam's age, the doom that took him off, with Troy in flames before his eyes. His towers had long fallen. He that in other days had ruled in pride so many lands and peoples, the power of Asia. On the distant shore, the vast, trunklet, the vast trunk, headless, 
lies without a name. Woof. Boy, oh boy. He, yeah, sadly, he did not have plot armor. So that is the end of Priam. Um, yes, it is uh, Achilles' son who has killed him. First killed one of his other many sons and then brutally took Priam and slaughtered him right there on the very altar itself. Uh, okay. For the first time that night, inhuman shuddering took me head to foot. I stood unmanned, and my dear father's image came to mind. As our king, just his age, mortally wounded, gasped his life away before my eyes. Creusa came to mind too, left alone. The house plundered, danger to little Ulysses. I looked around to take stock of my men, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so essentially, so back to Aeneas, he sees all this happening and he thinks of his father, his old father, the same age as Priam, and he thinks of his wife, who's back home with his son. You might want to keep those things in mind. It came, uh, it came to this, that I stood there alone, and then I saw lurking beyond the door sill of the Vesta, in hiding, silent, in that place reserved, the daughter of Tyndareus. Glare of fires lighted my step this way and that, my eyes glancing over the whole scene everywhere. That woman terrified of the Trojans' hate for the city overthrown, terrified too of Danaean vengeance, her abandoned husband's anger after years. Helen, that fury born to her own homeland and Troy, had gone to earth, a hated thing before the altars. Now fires blazed up in my own spirit, a passion to avenge my fallen town and punish Helen's whorishness. Shall this one look untouched on Sparta and Mycenae after her triumph, going like a queen and see her home and husband, kin and children with Trojan girls for escort, Phrygian slaves? Must Priam perish by the sword for this? Troy burn for this? Dardania's literal be soaked in blood so many times for this? Not by my leave. I know no glory comes of punishing a woman. The fear, the, the feet can bring no honor. Still, I'll be approved for snuffing out a monstrous life for a just sentence carried out. My heart will teem with joy in this avenging fire, and the ashes of my kin will be appeased. So ran my thoughts. I turned wildly upon her. But at that moment, clear before my eyes, never before so clear, in a pure light, stepping before me, radiant through the night, my loving mother came, immortal, tall, and lovely as the lords of heaven know her. Catching me by the hand, she held me back, then with her rose-red mouth reproved me. Son, <laughs> she starts out, uh, yes, you're not really supposed to go and murder women even if they've done wrong things. Uh, and so Venus literally comes and like grabs Aeneas by the hand and is like, mm, hold, hold on now. Son, why let such suffering goad you on to fury past control? Where is your thoughtfulness for me, for us? Will you not first revisit the place you left your father, worn and old, or find out if your wife, Creusa, lives, and the young boy, Ascanius, all these cut off by Greek troops foraging everywhere. Uh, and I mentioned this before, but remember that. So here is the, the line of, of Aeneas' family. So his father is Anchises, son Aeneas, and then his son is Ascanius, who is also known as Ulysses. There we go. So just so we have the names clear. Had I not cared for them, fire would by now have taken them. Their blood gut, or their, their blood glutted the sword. You must not hold the woman of Laconia, that hated face, the cause of this, 
nor Paris. The harsh will of the gods it is, the gods that overthrows the splendor of this place and brings Troy from her height into the dust. Look over there. I'll tear away the cloud that curtains you and films your mortal sight, the fog around you. Have no fear of doing your mother's will or balk at obeying her. Look where you see high masonry thrown down, stone torn from stone with billowing smoke and dust. Neptune is shaking from their beds the walls that his great trident pried up, undermining, toppling the whole city down. And look, Juno in all her savagery holds the Skian gates, and raging in steel armor calls her allied army from the ships up on the citadel. Turn, look! Pallas Tritonia crouched, or crouched in a storm cloud, lightning with her gorgon. Uh, that's the, the face of Medusa on, on the shield of, of uh, Minerva. The father himself empowers the Danaeans, urges assaulting gods on the defenders. Away, child, put an end to toiling so. I shall be near to see you safely home. So we get the idea here that humans always have some sort of a veil over our eyes and we cannot see what the gods are doing. So Venus is saying to Aeneas, like, look, I know you want to kill this Helen lady. I get you. I feel you. But you can't. And let me show you what's really going on. So she lifts the veil from his eyes and he can see all of these gods and goddesses who are, in some cases, literally besieging the city and bringing in their forces. And, you know, Neptune is, is literally shaking the walls apart. It's not going well for Troy. Bad stuff is happening. Um, <laughs> I knew the end then. Ilium was going down in fire. The Troy of Neptune going down. As in high mountains when the countrymen have notched an ancient ash then make their axes ring with might and main, chopping away to fell the tree, ever on the point of fallen, shaken through all its foliage, and the treetop nodding bit by bit, the strokes prevail until it gives a final groan at last and crashes down in ruin from the height. Yeah. So he goes back to his house to look for his family, uh, tells everybody else to flee, get out while they still can, The rest of us, Creusa and Ascanius and the servants, begged him in tears to not pull down with him our lives as well. Uh, he's trying to get his father to come with him. Did you suppose, my father, that I could tear myself away and leave you? Unthinkable. How could a father say it? Now, if it pleases the powers above that nothing stand of this great city, if your heart is set on adding your own death and ours to that of Troy, the door is wide open for it. Pyrrhus will be here, splashed with Priam's blood. He kills the son before his father's eyes, the father at the altars. My dear mother, was it for this, through spears and fire, you brought me to see the enemy deep in my house, to see my son, Ascanius, my father, and near them both, Creusa, butchered in one another's blood? My gear, men, bring me my gear. My, the last light calls the conquered. Give me back to the Greeks. Let me take up the combat once again. We shall not all die this day unavenged. Uh, <clears throat> I buckled on my armor. Uh, but at the door, Creusa hugged my knees, then held up little Ulysses. If you are going out to die, take us to face the whole thing with you. If experience leads you to put some hope in weaponry such as you now take, guard your own house here. When you have gone, to whom is Euless left? Your father? Wife? One called that long ago. She went on, and her wailing filled the house. But then a sudden portent came, a marvel. Amid his parents' hands and their sad faces, a point on Euless's head seemed to cast light. A tongue of flame that touched but did not burn him, licking his fine hair, playing round his temples. We, in panic, beat at the flaming hair and put the sacred fire out with water. Father Anchises lifted his eyes to heaven and lifted his hands, his, his voice, in joy. Uh, the baby is on fire. Fire, yes.
but it's a it's an omen it's a sign a portent uh, and then yes the the his grandfather so Anise's father and Kaizi said omnipotent Jupiter if prayers affect you look down upon us that is all I ask if by devotion to the gods we earn it grant us a new sign and confirm this portent so it's like okay look that was crazy there was just fire on that baby's head and it didn't burn him but just to be sure, give us another sign so we know. The old man barely finished when it thunder. Uh, the old man barely finished when it thundered a loud crack on the left. Out of the sky, through depths of night, a star fell, trailing flame, and glided on, turning the night to day. We watched it pass above the roof and go to hide its glare, its trace in Ida's wood. But still behind the luminous furrow shone and wide zones plumed with sulfur. So what is this? What's happening here? Is this a comet? Is it a meteor? It sounds like. It sounds like something is falling from the heavens, crashing to the ground, leaving fire and yeah, and sound in its wake. Right, yeah, is, is a comet going overhead? Is it a meteor actually hitting the earth? Who knows? People have tried to look back and match this up with astronomy records and uh, uh, media, actual meteor bits in modern day Turkey and tried to figure out if this could be a real thing. Um, nobody's been able to, <laughs> to make that work but uh but maybe it sounds like it sounds like it um and there's a there's we often hear this cool idea of when something crazy is happening at night it turns the night to day so it's so bright so bright now indeed my father overcome addressed the gods and rose in worship of the blessed star now now no more delay i'll follow you where you conduct me, there I'll be. Gods of my fathers, preserve this house, preserve my grandson. Yours this portent was. Troy's life is in your power. I yield, I go as your companion, son. Then he was still. We heard the blazing town crackle more loudly, felt the scorching heat. So Aeneas says, all right, look, we've gotten signs. We're all here. We have to go. They grab their stuff. Um, Aeneas is literally carrying his father around. Uh, Anchises is holding on to him. And Aeneas is carrying his old father on his back. Uh, there's lots of artwork of this. And then they, they grab their little, their little gods, their little symbols, and they start heading out. When I had said this, over my breadth of shoulder and bent neck, I spread out a lion's skin for tawny cloak and stooped to take his weight. Then little Ulysses put his hand in mine and came with shorter steps beside his father. A cute image of him holding his little son's hand. My wife fell in behind. Through shadowed places on we went, and I, lately unmoved by any spears thrown, any squads of Greeks, felt terror now at every eddy of wind, alarm at every sound, alert and worried. A worried alike for my companion and my burden. I had got near the gate, and now I thought we had made it all the way, when suddenly a noise of running feet came near at hand, and peering through the gloom ahead, my father cried out, Run, boy, here they come! I see flame light on shields, bronze shining. So they see what look like Greek soldiers, and they start running, running through the city. Alas, Creusa, taken from us by grim fate, did she linger or stray or sink in weariness? There is no telling. Never would she be restored to us. Ne never did I look back or think to look for her, lost as she was, until we reached the funeral mound and shrine of venerable Ceres. Here at last all came together, but she was not there. She alone failed her friends, her child, 
her husband. Out of my mind, whom did I not accuse? What man or God? What crueler loss had I beheld that night the city fell? Ascanius, my father, and the Teucrian Penates, I left in my friend's charge, hid them well in the hollow valley. I turned back alone into the city, cinching my bright harness, nothing for it but to run the risks again, go back again, comb all of Troy, and put my life in danger as before. So, Aeneas is, is fleeing Troy. He's got his old man on his back, his little son holding his hand. They see troops. They start running through the city, through this maze of the city. They get to a temple, and they look around. Oh, shit. My wife is gone. No idea when she when she, when we left her behind, if she ran a different direction. She's just gone. What am I going to do? There's sort of words that seem to blame her a little bit, but, but Aeneas does the right thing at this point. Uh, he makes sure his family's safe. He gets his, his weapons, and he heads back in the city to try to look for her. He retraces his steps. Can't find her. Then to our house, thinking she might, she might, just might have wandered there. Danaeans had got in and filled the place, and at that instant, fire they had set, consuming it, went roofward in a blast. Flames leaped and seethed in heat to the night sky. Uh, so he's going on and on. He's basically, on the one hand, we're seeing that Aeneas is, he's brave, he's got his family in mind, he's looking for his wife, but this is also... Again, he's seeing the destruction of his city. He's literally seeing the destruction of his own house. He wanders by and he sees the palace again. So we're getting layer on layer of the tragedy of Troy that Aeneas is forced to watch. Uh, he sees the all of the treasures of, treasures of Troy that the Greeks are stealing. Drawn up around them, boys and frightened mothers stood in a line... Time after time I groaned and crawl, called Creusa, frantic in endless quest from door to door. Then, to my vision, her sad wraith appeared. Creusa's ghost, larger than life, before me, chilled to the marrow. I could feel the hair on my head rise, the voice clot in my throat, but she spoke out to ease me of my fear. What's to be gained by giving way to grief so madly, my sweet husband? Nothing here has come to pass except as heaven willed. You may not take Creusa with you now. It was not so ordained, nor does the Lord of High Olympus give you leave. For you, long exile awaits and long sea miles to plow. You shall make landfall on Hesperia, where Lydian Tiber flows, with gentle pace between rich farmlands, and the years will bear glad peace, a kingdom and a queen for you. Dismiss these tears for your beloved Creusa. I shall not see the proud homelands of Myrmidons or of Dilopians, or go to serve Greek ladies, Darden lady that I am, and daughter-in-law of Venus the Divine. No, the great mother of the gods detains me here on these shores. Farewell now. Cherish still your son and mine. Uh, let me finish this real quick and then I'll talk about what it means. With this she left me weeping, wishing that I could say so many things, and faded on the tenuous air. Three times I tried to put my arms around her neck, three times enfolding nothing as the wraith slipped through my fingers, bodiless as wind or like a flitting dream. So in the end, as night waned, I rejoined my company, and there, to my astonishment, I found new refugees in a great crowd, men and women gathered for exile, young, pitiful people coming from every quarter, minds made up with their belongings for whatever lands I'd lead them by sea. The morning star now rose on Ida's ridges, bringing day. Greeks had secured the city gates. No help or hope of help existed. So I resigned myself, picked up my father, and turned my face toward the mountain range. And that is the end of book two. So, 
Aeneas goes hunting through the city. Sees all sorts of terrible things happening. Who knows? Is about to go crazy. Start fighting again. And sees not his wife, but the ghost of his wife. At some point, she's died. We don't know how or what she was doing or where she ended up or who killed her. We don't know. She's just dead. But her ghost appears and tells Aeneas, Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's over. You have to go. And then gives him a bit of prophecy. You're going to have a long travel. You're going to make it somewhere cool. You're going to get a new wife. <laughs> Don't worry, things will be fine. Uh, but she also does point out, too, that in her words, she says, I'm lucky. I died here. I'm not going home as a slave to some Greek household and being forced to work for them. So that's good also. <laughs> Uh, and then Aeneas makes his way back out of the city safely, uh, and he sees not only is it his family that he left behind, but a big group of Trojan refugees have gathered there, and they're just waiting for him to lead them to ships and hopefully to safety. Uh, yeah, Tiny Chris, we, again, I, 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 I make jokes about it, but yeah, we see the number three, especially the number three pops up just like literally everywhere in every culture all over the world. Three is... Everything comes in threes. Very, very important. So I always like to, to point it out when, when we see it happen. Oh, yeah. To the, uh, Chrisella, yes. Uh, it's totally a disaster movie. Every, everything is bad. People are dying left and right. There's fire everywhere. There's a meteor. <laughs> it's bad times. Three is definitely, definitely a magic number. So book three, and again, usually when we talk about ancient works, when there are subheadings, subtitles for chapters, uh, it's usually a modern invention. So this calls book three, Sea Wanderings and Strange Meetings. So that book was a little bit more like the Iliad, right? We get fighting, we get the actual city of Troy, characters that we saw in the Iliad, although we do have a lot of running away and escaping. This chapter is going to be much more like the Odyssey, traveling over the water, running into weird people and things, uh, and trying to get to a land, a promised land at the end of the voyage. So they escape to nearby they build a fleet of ships, and uh, and they set sail. So they head out. Beyond that water lies the land of Mars, great plains plowed by the men of Thrace, and ruled in ancient days by cruel like Hergus. Uh, do, 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 do. Now making la uh, making landfall under the south wind. There, I plotted out on that curved shore the walls of a colony though fate opposed it, and I devised the name Aeneidae for the people from my own. So he finds a land, he's the, like the first land he gets to, he's like, okay, we're going to make a colony, we're going to call it, they're going to call it after me, and we're going to, we're just going to live here. They, they make some sacrifices. Uh... Okay, he's looking for... All right, let's, let's read this part. So he's, he's getting ready to perform some sacrifices. Now as it happened, the ground rose nearby in a low hummock, overgrown with cornel and myrtle saplings flickering in a thicket. I stepped over, trying to tear away green stuff out of the mound to make a roof of bows and leaves over the altar. There I had sight of a gruesome prodigy beyond description when the first stalk came torn out of the earth and the root and the root network burst dark blood dripped down to soak and foul the soil shuddering took me my heart's blood ran slow and chill with fear but once more i went forward and fought to pull another stubborn shoot to find what cause lay hid there and again 
dark crimson blood ran out of the ripped bark. My spirit strove hard. I paid reverence to nymphs of the wild woods and Father Mars, guardian of Thrace, that they might make this vision turn to good and lift away the omen. Then I doubted my effort. A third time wrenched at a green shoot, grappling on my knees against the sandy ground. Should I tell this or hold my peace? A groan came from the mound, a sobbing muffled in the depth of earth, and words were carried upward. Must you rend me, derelict that I am, Aeneas? Spare me, now I am in the grave. Spare your clean hands, defilement. I am no foreigner. Old Troy gave birth to me. This blood drips from no tree. Ah, put the savage land behind you. Leave this shore of greed. For I am Polydorus. An iron hedge of spears covered my body, pinned down here, and the pointed shafts took root. At, at this, be sure that in a maze of dread I stopped, appalled. My hair stood up. My voice choked in my throat. This man, this Polydorus, ill-starred Priam, had sent some years before, in secret, with great weight of gold, to be maintained by the Thracian king. That was a... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Anyway. So he... He gets to this place. He's trying to make a sacrifice, make... Beseech the gods. Starts pulling up some foliage to put on the altar and blood comes out of the ground not once not twice but three times and there's a groan from the earth and it turns out it's his old friend who came to this land way back uh during the iliad time uh and was murdered and put in the ground and has basically been cursed and has cursed therefore this this land itself so, uh, yeah, Aeneas is already finding crazy, crazy shit out there. Um, yeah, after Fortune had left us, threw in his lot with Agamemnon's cause and winning arms, broke every pact and oath, killed Polydorus, and took the gold by force. That was the, the local king that did that. When faintness of dread left me, I brought before the leaders of the people, my father first, these portents of the gods and asked their judgment all were in of one mind we should withdraw from that earth stained with blood with guesthood so profaned and give our ships the wind and sea again yeah no yeah get the fuck out of there don't stay there that's not a good place for polydorus therefore we held a funeral on his grave we heaped up earth and altars to the dead were decked with night blue bands and cypress gloom so they perform all the, the, the appropriate rites, and then they GTFO. They sail away. Now, interesting, though, interesting to note there, Aeneas sees this horrible, crazy thing. He doesn't immediately tell his people, nope, we're out of here. What does he do? He gathers together all the old people, the leaders. He tells them what he saw and asks them what they think. Now, hold on. This is not... This is not like Odysseus. This is different. And we'll continue to see differences. How Aeneas is not like... Achilles. Aeneas is not like Odysseus. He does things a little bit, a little bit differently. And again... Romans would hear this. Romans would read this. And they're like, Aeneas is honoring his elders? We like that. That's a thing we Romans are all about. <laughs> so again, it's just cultural differences between the two. Um, is the Odyssey the one where Greek, where Kirk finds the green women? Uh, Zardas, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, colonialism goes way back. All, all the way back. All the way. All the way. Um, I think I'm going to stop there for today. We're going to get more... More landings. More visitations of weird things on the way to uh, Carthage. Because, again, we'll pick up... 
see. So that's yeah. So back when we get to book four, um, it'll pick up back in the current part of the story with Dido in Carthage, um, in a chapter called "The Passion of the Queen." Mm. But it's crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, I hope you're enjoying this. Like I said, I, I really do like the Aeneid. There's lots of cool stuff that happens in this book. Um, a lot of really interesting Roman things that are, are talked about and emphasized versus the Greek stuff of the, the previous epic poems. Aeneas is a pretty cool hero. Again, largely because of that. He's not just about murdering his enemies uh, he does at times have true feelings and emotions and love for other characters uh, he is dragging around his his good old dad and his son so it's a little bit of different of a different take on a on a, a great hero um, yeah so this week what's happening this week I think it's all normal stuff this week, like I had said on Saturday. Toys tomorrow. Wednesday we'll continue working on the night. Um, I'll try to get the, the parts I scrounged from all the electronics cleaned up and talk about sort of my... Well, I don't know. Maybe... We'll see. We'll see. Maybe on Wednesday I'll just keep working on the actual night itself, and then on Friday we'll look at, at parts for conversion. I don't know, some, some combination of, of those. And then, what else? Oh, also, so tomorrow will be Toys in the Morning, Dune with Jessica in the Afternoon, Wednesday. So, it, it didn't happen last week. There were some issues, but I, I promise, I hope, I hope that this Wednesday will be the return of Myths and Video Games with Pete Wiz. Uh, at the last minute, we were not able to do it last week, unfortunately. But I'm very much looking forward to restarting that because we are... Pete has been playing like a madman. He has hundreds of gigabytes worth of footage of him playing the latest Assassin's Creed game. So we will be talking about all of the cool Norse mythology in it. Um, I'm very excited. I have not watched any gameplay of that game and of course I haven't played it I don't play video games but um, I'm very excited to uh, to do that so Wednesday it will be happening I I almost guarantee it things you know things happen um, usual no stream on Thursday I've got some doing with uh, with family oh that's right Hudsonizer yeah I forgot it is first contact day so there for all you Star Trek nerds um, happy first contact day. And then, yeah, normal stuff on Figure Friday stream on Friday and then Saturday War Room stream. And, like I said, I will be hosting the Home Buddies group stream Saturday night. So I better figure out what we're doing. <laughs> I have ideas, but all of them require require some, uh, some work ahead of time. So I will get to work on that. In the meantime, I hope that you all are off to a good start to your week. I hope everyone has a good week. It's a bunch of interesting, interesting crap going on out there. Planning what? Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> I try, I try to plan as little as possible, but some things, some things really do require it. May we we may do another play. Um, again, I just have to. Just have to find the time to get it ready. Surprisingly, when you look up these ancient tragedies, especially online, uh, it's not easy to find. Like, you can find the texts online for all of these things, but you can't easily find places where it says like, "Oh, you know, in this play, these are the characters, and here's how." And here's how many lines each character has. So typically I have to take the text and then like either do my own notations and then add up all the lines and then sort of figure it out. So it, take, it, it takes some work to, uh, 
to divide up lines and make sure that there's some attempt at, at parody. I, parity. Uh, I don't want... I try not to do plays where like one character has almost all the lines and then everybody else just has a couple of background characters. It's tough sometimes, though. Was, like I said, I was, I was really lucky. The first few plays that we did had a really... A relatively easy line distribution and it was mostly even um, the last couple were a bit a bit more difficult especially Oedipus and that's why like mul multiple people shared the character of Oedipus just because he had most of the lines in that play which you know you might you might expect um, so yeah that's that's all all the cool stuff that's going on here um, as always, if um, if any of you ever have ideas of things that you think would be interesting for me to read, for me to talk about, um, for me to look at, if it's something you know online that we could look at together, let me know. I'm always open for for suggestions. I got a bunch of my own crap, but I'm always I'm always open to new stuff. Um, so yeah, have I considered doing Harvey? Um, no. No, I haven't. But you never know. You never know what might happen. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else. I don't think so. Don't know. All right. Uh, yeah, so everyone, have a great rest of your Monday. And I'll see you tomorrow for toys. Toys on a Tuesday. Um, are we going to raid anyone? Hmm. Hey, Bondo, I did. I am sleek and smooth. Can it be Saturday already? Uh, no. I'm sorry, Robin Wombath. You got a couple of these before that. Uh, I am not, we're not going to raid anybody. We're just going to be free, travel into the, the internet world, uh, Go find some other cool people and then report back and tell us all about it. Uh, there's there's some weird thing happening on Twitter. I don't know if you saw last night. Hey, Peg Junk. Uh, he, right, it's it's the it's the aerodynamics for for miniature painting. There was this weird thing on Twitter. Uh, Bert challenged Joe Star to a game of Warhammer, and then somehow um, I, I <laughs> Lucas and I were tagged in to be part of it. And then it kept growing from there. So if you want that to happen in some way, jump in on that. And add, add your tweets to it. I was watching a movie with my wife and I looked up and I had like a, a million notifications. Like, what is going on? Uh, so yeah. If you'd like to see that happen, uh, let everybody know. <laughs> it was weird. It was good. It was fun. Uh, yeah, my wife and I watched I Care A Lot on Netflix. Which, uh, which was a, a very interesting movie. It was, it was good. Cool. Okay. Um, but I do need to get going. So we can talk more about that later. Have a great Monday, everybody. I'm just signing off. No raiding. Uh, it was good. The movie was good. It was interesting. A lot of... Just a lot of characters who are bad people. So it's, it's like, who do I root for? But yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, I gotta go. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.